The World Council of Churches throws out a common lectionary every week as scriptures that are advised by every preacher throughout the world to focus on. And this John text that Jan just read so beautifully is in back-to-back-to-back weeks, which doesn't usually happen. I thought, a trifecta. That might be a little too much of John 1 for everybody to hear three times in a row. I thought, maybe I should preach instead as we're coming up on Epiphany and the Magi's journey to Bethlehem. Maybe we should focus on Matthew's telling of the birth of Jesus the one that doesn't usually get talked about on Christmas Eve because it's a little darker. There's no shepherds. There's no angels chorus singing in the sky. There's no even traveling to Bethlehem or census. No, and rather you have Joseph disturbed by dreams when he hears that his engaged-to-be betrothed, legally bound married woman, Mary, is pregnant, but the baby is not his. I thought, well, what a great opportunity to preach about what happens when somebody does something, intentionally or not, that makes you ashamed, hurt, feeling betrayed. Uh, Your family feels humiliated. And Joseph, it says, decides that he's going to dismiss the wedding quietly, taking the attention off of, he could point fingers as so many do today, what, look at Mary, look at her, look at what kind of person she is and all the assumptions therein and instead says, I'm calling off the wedding. It's me. Wow. Or the piece about the Magi looking for a light, seeking, seeking the sacred, seeking the holy in a time where a lot feels dull and difficult to see that which is hopeful or light. That'll preach today. And following this light, seeking it out until it comes to the place where they find their truth. Or maybe the grittiest of all the parts of Matthew's story, when King Herod, paranoid King Herod, the great, they say, historically, because he built all these aqueducts and coliseums and a place for the games in the third Olympics held in Palestine. He's built one of the greatest marinas in the world. And yet he's so unsure and unsettled by this news that there's a kid born to be the new king of Israel that like Pharaoh in Exodus, he sends out his soldiers to slaughter the innocent children, male children of Bethlehem. Hmm. We could talk about civilian casualties and carpet bombing and drone strikes. We could talk about kids who are fleeing everything to come to this country on their own, children, sometimes locked up at the borders. Talk about school shootings in Michigan, Sandy Hook, slaughter of innocents. But it's not Matthew's week. This is John. John doesn't get into this detail about the birth of Jesus. No, it's a 10,000 foot look at the beginning of who is this that is coming into the world. John says in the beginning, a link way back to Genesis was the word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And later it says that He lived amongst them. Uh, The literal Greek for that is He pitched His tent amongst us. I love that Greek phrase. Have you ever been camping with somebody? That's an intimate experience. (laughs) And not everything always goes right when you go camping. Uh, It rains, tent blows over. God pitches God's tent in our messiness up close. But it's not just camping out with humanity. It's the one who creates everything 
desires face-to-face closeness. The one who seems far off and is creating the cosmos, in him was life, and that life was the light of humankind, draws near. It's a bold and radical claim that the gospel writer makes. And that term life, we read that in English and say, oh, okay, that's very beautiful prose. It's one of the most beautiful texts in New Testament gospel writing. John's a great writer of whoever wrote that gospel in his name. But in Greek, there are three different words for life. There's bios. Anybody have biology class in school? Or, uh, so bios means life, daily life or, or being alive. In scripture, you hear uh, in the parable of the sower, when Jesus says, there are those who grew up among the thorns and they preferred the pleasures of this life, stuff that happens in day to day, more than they did their faith, so they got choked off and their faith withered and died. Okay, bios, life. That's not the word used here. Then there's suke, psychology, psychiatry, uh, consciousness, self, uh, spirit, soul, inner self. Jesus uses this as well in Matthew's gospel, 16th chapter. Um, those who want to save their suke, their soul, their spirit, uh, will lose it. But those who lose their self for my sake, lose their soul for my sake, will gain it. You've heard that very familiar text. That's not the word either. All right, pastor, you're telling us all the things it's not. Tell us what it is. The word is Zoe. And Zoe in Greek means divine life, connection to the divine. It means life abundant. I have come that they might have life and life abundant. Different than just going through the motions, brushing your teeth, getting up, having cereal, go to to school, go to work. Different than daily life routine. No, life, Zoe life is this connection to the divine being the essence of life and thereby your life is fuller richer and sees differently than just going through the motions in fact the radical concept is such that it's often misinterpreted or mispracticed in christianity because so often i hear christians talking about well when we die and go to be with eternity with God, then we'll be with God face to face. No, 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 no. The Gospel of John says, hey, this abundant life starts right now when you see this relationship with God unfold in your life. Abundant life is a present future tense. It starts now. It never stops once you've got it. Can't hope to contain it. In 2008, the Washington Post did an experiment. They wanted to see, and you can question their methods or not, whether they were accurate or not, but they wanted to see in our busy day-to-day rat race lives, lives, um, how much could we stop for a moment to appreciate beauty or to recognize something powerful happening in our midst. So the world-renowned violinist, Josh Bell, who plays to packed concert halls and symphony halls and opera houses around the world, opened his $3.6 million Stradivarius violin case in the LaFont Plaza of Washington, D.C. subway. And for 45 minutes played the concerto that he had played just nights before into a packed out house of over 1,000 people, sold out. And he played and played and played. And over a thousand people walked back and forth during that 45 minutes. And one, one stopped and recognized who he was. He made $35. Not bad, but not what he normally makes. And the point of the experiment was to see if people really appreciated or were able to appreciate in the moment 
an inbreaking of something beautiful, something rich, something wonderful in a place that it normally wasn't, or at least so they thought. I thought, that's very much how we tell the story of the birth of Jesus. Shows up in Bethlehem. There's no Christmas. Nobody notices. Nobody cares. And yet in that moment, Luke and Matthew say, okay, Augustus is Caesar. He's powerful. Everything's going on in Rome. Pilate's over here, governor of Judea. Everybody's paying attention to him in the headlines. But we want you to look over here, this little backwater area, a cave in Bethlehem to some poor kids because the light of the world has arrived. Let me put this another way. When John is talking about life and life abundant, we have Justin here and Kelly. You hear sometimes Justin might play a hymn, and it, you know it's okay. He he knows the hymn. He can play it certainly, and he plays it. But compare it to a song either he's written, or or one of the pieces that the band has really felt, and you see him moving. You see the music becomes part of who he is. They are one and the same, alive with it. It's a difference between just hitting notes and being one with the song. That's what John is talking about in this connection of relationship with life with God. That life was the light of humanity. And that's the other thing that I think about. Some of you sometimes talk to me a little bit about science. And I think about the ability of the human eye to see the spectrum of light. It's minuscule. If you look at the entire light spectrum, what amount our eyes can actually see. What we can see is beautiful. But if you look at the entire spectrum of light, there's all kinds of light in the universe that we cannot actually see, but is all around us. A recognition of the presence of light that sometimes we miss, though it's there all the time. And then with all this beautiful prose about life and this relationship that is offered by the one who comes incarnate into the world, we have this strange interruption. There was this guy, John, showed up to point or witness or testify to the light. He's not the light. John does this a lot in John's gospel. But he's here to testify to the light. It's kind of a strange way to interrupt this prologue of the gospel that has been first about the word of God come into the world and now interrupted with, he's not even called John the Baptist, right, in this moment, just John. Could be John Hall. Could be John anybody, right? John shows up. And what is John all about? With this life, he is in this relationship with the word going to point to the beauty of God with everything he's got. There was a time in my own life where I had hit kind of rock bottom. It was a a much younger time, almost 30 years ago in my life. I was still in high school. And on one hand, things were going really well. Straight A student, athletics going well, friendships, family, church. And like many young kids, I had this heartbreak. Girl I had dated about two years broke up with me. Thought it was the end of my world. As sometimes teenagers do. Don't have any experience to go around with it. And the thing is, you you start doubting yourself, your confidence starts to change, and you you start to think, well, if this person can't love me, or or if if I, you know, you start to look at all the things that are blessings as doubts, and they start to snowball. And I remember I had lost like 15 pounds. I wasn't very heavy to begin with in high school. I'd gone to counselors, to my parents, to say, you know, I'm, I'm having some dark thoughts. I'm thinking things that I don't normally think. I wonder if the world would just be better without me. 
And I find sometimes during the holiday season, sometimes we have those happy New Year's experiences, but sometimes we look back at the past or we've been with family, and sometimes that's a great thing, but sometimes it brings up stuff. And we begin to struggle with how we see ourselves. We resolve to change the things that we wish were different in the new year, but then we say, I can't do it. And I remember in that moment of my life where kind of like uh, George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life, I just thought, I'm out of here. And I remember in that moment of my life, Jesus saying quite literally to me one night, we, we, we are not done yet. And I thought to myself after that moment, yeah, things feel crummy, but there's a lot of beautiful things in life that I have been blinded to. Darkness has been too heavy. I've been too down or depressed to see it. But God is pulling me out. And I, I share that story not to get you down, but to th say that for the last 30 years of my life, every youth group kid I've met, every church I've served, and I never imagined I'd serve a church or preach a sermon. I was terrified to speak in public or to have a wife or children or family. Every day since that day has been a second gift and a chance to testify to life, to the one who is life and the light of my life. I'm not the light, not even John, not even close. But with this life we're given, we always have an opportunity to point to the beauty of God, to point to love, Whether you struggle with Trinity or the dual natures of Christ or all those theological doctrines, here's the basic truth. It's all about relationship with God and with each other. That's life. None of this other stuff can you take with you. But what's in here and the energy and spirit we share between each other, that's where the light of God is. One last thought for you this morning. In Japan, when they have vessels of clay, uh, sometimes, you know, just like anywhere else, a clay vessel will break, a porcelain vessel will break, it'll crack. And so there's an art in J Japan, kitsugi, where they take precious metals, silver, gold, platinum, and they repair the cracks in the vessel with those precious metals, actually highlighting the flaw, the thing that's broken. You might say, well, that's kind of strange. Why not just, if it's broken, I mean, in today's culture, many of us, if something's broken, we just throw it out, get something new. But there's a power in showing the scars, showing the flaws, and saying, yes, this is where I've been, but I'm made new in a new way. And those flaws, those dark places, those struggles, those pains, actually highlight what I've been through, but they make me part of who I am today. And I wouldn't change those because sometimes it's in the difficult roads that we learn the most about who we are or who we're supposed to be. It always strikes me as powerful that in this same gospel, when Jesus shows up in the upper room to a bunch of startled disciples because the last he saw of them, they were running for their lives, is that he shows them his scars. Yeah. You remember, you guys were all a part of this. This is what happened to me. I remember. But that's not where this story ends. 
I bring peace. I bring life. I've returned that you might have life and life abundant and not stuck in the ways of violence, prejudice, hatred, and darkness. So this new year, where is this life in you? Are we just going through the bios, the daily plucking at the notes? Or is this song becoming part of who you are? And they're one and the same.